Welcome to Point Me to Jesus. I'm your host, Tara McClary Reeves, and I am so excited to introduce you today to Rachel Ruth Wright. Rachel Ruth is the daughter of Dr. Danny and Ann Graham Lotz. She is the granddaughter of Billy and Ruth Graham. Uh, after graduating from Baylor University in Waco, Texas, Rachel Ruth married Stephen Wright, a high school football coach, and they are the proud parents of three girls, and I'm going to get their names correctly, Belle, Sophia, and Riggin. Rachel Ruth is such a wonderful inspiration to my family and to my children because she has a passion, not just for women's ministry, but also for children's ministry as well. She has spoken across the country on numerous platforms, pointing others to the Lord Jesus. Rachel Ruth serves on the board of her mom's fabulous ministry, Angel Ministries, and she's also the prayer coordinator. And we certainly appreciate her desire to get that team on their knees in prayer for her mom and the places that the Lord has taken her. And now Rachel Ruth is being taken to a lot of those places uh, and the internet's helping that. She has a new online Bible study through the book of Genesis. That's a weekly Bible study. We'll be sharing a little bit more information about that. She has a passion for home ministry as well as student ministry. She leads a weekly Bible study at the University of North Carolina which your dad has quite a history there too, doesn't he, Rachel? <laughs> yeah. And we, we're just so glad that you can encourage our audience today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I just am so honored to be able to be on it and just thrilled to see you and be a part of this. So thank you. Well, it's just a blessing to me. You know, both of our, our parents uh, have have all four of our parents really, even though your dad is uh, is in the presence of the king right now, but on earth uh, he had a ministry, of course, at his alma mater through athletics. Uh, he was such an accomplished athlete and basketball player and a Bible study teacher. He and Albert Long just challenged so many men and in that area and across our country. But um, but your mom and, and traveling. And so in a sense, they were in ministry together. And then my mom and dad, Cleve and Deanna McClary, have been in ministry together. And in so much of our backgrounds is so similar, Rachel Ruth. And, and I think that's what's so encouraging to me is to see another child of, um, you know, parents that have just been so surrendered to Christ, uh, desire that same ministry yourself, knowing that your marriage and, and your family, of course, those three girls are your, your first ministry, but how the Lord has just really expanded your boundaries now. Well, it is, it really is, uh, amazing how the Lord has done that because I've watched my parents and seen, you know, the different ministries that they've had and, and didn't know what the Lord was going to do with me because I struggled through school <laughs> all growing up and just, it, it was difficult for me. And, uh, and so this really is a Lord taking over my weaknesses. And so to be able to teach God's word, and I do have a passion for God's word. I do love Jesus with all my heart. And um, and I saw it played out in my parents' life, but then it's become my own. And, and so I love the Lord and, uh, and I'm so appreciative to have grown up in a home where it was taught and by, you know, word, by example in every way. And, um, and so, you know, that's a passion of mine is to pass it on, you know, to pass it on to my kids and, and those around me. And so just like you, I mean, it's a real heart, real passion of mine. So, and to see your dad in the medical field, your dad was my, my sister's yeah. dentist. And, you yeah. know, I mean, just to, to let our audience know that whatever your calling is in life, that is your mission field, yeah. you yeah. know, whether it is at home with an infant right now, changing diapers and supporting your husband out or whatever, uh, you know, that, that, that is our mission field. Uh, Rachel Ruth, were you ever intimidated by, um, your maternal grandparents in any way? You know, I wasn't. And I know, I think my brother kind of struggled with that. I've got some cousins that kind of struggled with that, but I didn't. I don't know why. Um, maybe it was just the Lord's, you know, mercy in my life or grace or whatever, but I, I just so love them as my grandparents. I knew, you know, I mean, I saw, we called him Daddy Bill was my grandfather and Teta, which means old lady in Chinese. And so <laughs> I called him Daddy Bill and Teta. 
And, um, and just knowing them as grandparents, I mean, I just adored them. I loved them and they were so loving to me. And so then if I saw them, you know, saw Daddy Bill on TV or whatever, it was just, there's Daddy Bill, you know? And, um, and so I don't think I felt the pressure because I think I'm a very black and white person. I love the Lord. I was taught God's word and then I was going to live it out. That was just, a, I just made the choice to live it out, even though everyone around me didn't yeah. and um, in school and stuff. But, um, but I didn't, I don't think I felt that pressure. I think I just wanted, first of all, to please the Lord. And, um, and then it just, you know, kind of came naturally from that. But, um, but I just love my grandparents, miss them so much. So well, knowing your mom and your dad and, and, and you, you know, you are so down to earth. And I think you are such an amazing reflection of, of your maternal grandparents. I didn't know your paternal grandparents. I'm sure they were great too, because your dad was so awesome. But, uh, you know, I, I was blessed. I have many memories of going up to, to Little Piney Cove uh, where they lived on Montreat Mountain. Was there a special memory that you had when, when they were home, not traveling that, that your, was there a special cookie that Ted had made for you or? <laughs> I don't remember her ever making cookies, but Chinese, she made Chinese food and it was so good. But, um, but I have so many memories there. I just love it. And I, I miss, I miss being up there with them. And my family, for whatever reason, my family spent a lot of time up there and we were the ones that stayed on the mountain with them and, and spent my summers up there. And, and, um, and so I, I love it. I love the house. I love the mountain. I love hiking all over it and hearing the bears and, yeah. you know, and their dogs barking at night. And, and, um, but the thing I think I miss the most is the fellowship that we would have and, we would sit around the table for years. I mean, we would sit around the table at dinner for hours, you know, and just talk. I remember asking Daddy Bill a million questions and, and talking to Teta about growing up in China or whatever. And then as they got older and they couldn't really come out to the, you know, front room where we would eat, we yeah. would just go back into their room and just sit with them and and talk and talk and talk and it was always centered around the Lord so yeah. everything was about you know what are you learning in the Bible right now and oh I just was able to share Christ with this person and and daddy but what was it like when you went to India and shared Christ and, and so it was very meaningful deep yeah. rich conversation all the time and um yeah. and Tete my grandmother loved painting and she loved clouds and, and we were Teta and I were very very close and I love paint you know I don't ever have time anymore but I used to love to paint and um and so just even stuff like that I mean we would talk about and um and she was an encouragement to me growing up because I really struggled with um being insecure and I struggled struggled with the way I looked and um and I was very much a tomboy growing up, just, you know, loved to play sports and I would play hard with my dad and my brother. And, and um, I don't know, I just, I really struggled with that. And my sister got a lot of accolades growing up and everything. And, and I felt like I was kind of in her shadow and my brother's shadow. And Tete used to write me the sweetest letters. I pulled some out recently just to reread them, but just encouraging me. Um, you know, that about inner beauty and, um, and to work on my relationship with the Lord and that that would come out and, and, uh, just so much wisdom, you know, and I, uh, I miss it. So I just, I look forward to being with them in heaven, but well, you're her namesake too. You know, I'm sure that that was a, a special bond for y'all, but I, you know, I can recall just, just there, how personable, but every story, every piece of furniture in that house had this amazing story behind it and I and I can remember one of mom's most embarrassing and horrifying moments because as you know I mean your your grandparents really discipled my parents um in their the early days of of their growing faith and ministry and and mom and dad were young well, dad was seven years older than mom but mom was probably 21 when she had me after uh, they had gotten married before dad volunteered to go to Vietnam and your grandparents had invited our family for dinner at Little Piney Cove, and Krista and I are only 17 months apart, and we were incredibly rambunctious in those toddler years, and mom had not really learned yet 
the importance of just godly discipline, you know, from a parenting standpoint. So Ruth really just took mom under her wing with that. But, oh, I jumped on one table and I think I broke the leg on the table <laughs> to show you that people are so much more important than possessions. Mm -hmm. You know, your grandmother immediately just comforted mom and said, oh, Deanna, oh, yeah. you cannot hurt that table. You just, there's nothing you could do to hurt that table. Mm -hmm. I think mom looked it up when they got home. That was like from the Ming dynasty or something. <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was an old table. All right. <laughs> mom was mortified. But that just shows you just how your grandparents were, you know I mean? Yes. It was all about, the heart and mm -hmm. uh, and loving on that heart wherever that heart was at that particular time. So, mm -hmm. with with your dad, I think wasn't this past month the thirty year anniversary of your of, of Daddy Bill's graduation to heaven? Yeah, it was. Yeah, your mom did such a beautiful job at mm -hmm. the graduation oh. ceremony. What what was of of that day as a as a grandchild of of Billy Graham? That day was so monumental for all of us. I mean, worldwide, it was televised everywhere. Was there a particular thing that was said or done that, that really you take away with you often in your memories? I think, um, I mean, that whole, we, we did like a week of things um, that week. I mean, going to the Capitol, you know, in Washington and, and seeing all these senator, all the senators came into the rotunda, yeah. you know, to it was it was really unbelievable that they came just because of daddy bill's love for the lord for giving the gospel out i mean it's just i just can't even believe that happened but um so there were so many memories but that specific day of um you know the service it was what my mom said and um and i can remember some of the other stuff but when she got up there it was just like Boom. I mean, she yeah. just laid it out. And, and well, your, your granddaddy always said she was the better preacher. <laughs> oh, uh, and I couldn't agree more, but yeah, but, um, she just knows the time knows it, it was really, she's called it a shot across the bow, you know, that when daddy bill passed away, it wasn't just, oh, there goes a great preacher. It was, it was like a word from the Lord, you know, yeah. wake up because Jesus is coming back. Yeah. And, and we're, this is like the, this is a, a message to the church, you know, yeah. a message to the world that he's coming and to be ready. And, yeah. um, and it's a very significant thing um, when he passed away. And so we are in those last days, we are looking at the Lord, you know, soon to return. Mm -hmm. And, and I felt like she just used that and it, it was such a powerful message in just a short amount of time. And I felt like I was sitting there, I felt like my hair was blowing back. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. like, wow. It was awesome. And um, because that would have been Daddy Bill's heart too, you know, and we miss him. We want him here with us. I just, we were grieving and crying, but, but that was, that was the message of the day. So, well, and I think you and your mother both are just doing such a good job to, to carry that mantle. And I've sat uh, under your mother's teaching for just decades now. I mean, from just give me Jesus to uh, just having her personally encourage some Bible studies that I've taught through the years, but she really is becoming more and more impassioned about the nearness of Christ's return and for us being ready. And I sense in your teaching that you feel the same. And so explain to our audience how the Lord is expanding your ministry right now, Rachel Ruth, why you would choose the first book of the Bible, Genesis, uh, to go um, and kind of use that as your springboard into, into your current women's ministry. Well, I, I've been teaching, you mentioned, it, I've been teaching, I've been teaching this Bible study at University of North Carolina. This is my eighth year. And and so when COVID hit, um, it, we had to go online. And so probably yeah. back in the spring, um, I taught the book of Esther that I'd done three books last year, but I taught the book of Esther at the end and we had that online. And then this year we decided to do it again because we couldn't meet in person. And, uh, and I pray that the Lord would just give it wings. And he did. I mean, we've got people from every, all these countries all over the world and and they're discussing and sharing scripture. We do that for the first part. And then I give a message, the second part, but, but um, I really have a heart for the old Testament. I love the old Testament because I feel like I learn from stories and the old Testament is filled with stories and it just helps me visualize it. I, I have this wild imagination and, 
And, um, and so I've been teaching through so many of the Old Testament books the past eight years, and, and I wanted to go back and do Genesis. And so um, to just kind of go back to where it all started, and, and then the Lord has just kind of busted this Bible study open. And, and I just love it because I do have a passion for God's word, for teaching it, for getting it out and making it simple, you know, just making it easy to understand. And, um, and so the Lord's just kind of given me that, that platform to be able to do that. And, and I'm so honored uh, growing up. I always felt like I wanted to be a missionary and had a heart for Africa and have been there multiple times and, and then, you know, married a football coach. And so we're here in North Carolina, but I feel like the Lord has knew that and just has opened this up. And I feel like I'm a missionary in this Bible study now to be able to be talking and becoming friends with these women in Lebanon and Russia and Ethiopia and Germany and all over the place. And we can sit in our own rooms, you know, in our homes and just break open scripture together. It is the thrill of my life. I love it. And, um, and I'm very thankful. So. so many are being encouraged and you are, I think, as a product of your parents and your dad was so practical and commonsensical and things um, just with illustrations and, and your mom certainly is. I mean, you cannot go on a walk with your mom for two minutes that she doesn't come back and have this amazing spiritual analogy that we can all relate to. And of course, your maternal grandparents did the same thing. You know, I mean, just they, they would they would embrace, not embrace the culture, but whatever was going on in the culture, and they would turn the attention of whatever that particular focus was back onto the truth of God's mm -hmm. word. What's, what's one, uh, and, and you know, God's word is alive and active. So stories that you and I've read, maybe last year, the Lord will bring a newness and a fullness to this year. What, what's one in particular uh, as you're teaching Genesis again, that's been like that, wow. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's been so many things. Um, it really is remarkable. And I do feel like that every week I get excited about what the Lord's going to teach me this week, because I, I literally feel like I have to live, I end up living through what I'm teaching that week. It's yeah. kind of bizarre. And, um, but um, one thing, if I pick one thing, one thing that has really stuck out was Noah. And, and we all know about Noah and we think of the ark and all the animals and everything, but really studying it in depth and thinking about actually what he did. And he was, he was a farmer by trade. So he, he worked the land. And then all of a sudden God comes to him and says, Noah, I want you to build an ark and it's gonna be, gives him the measurements and everything. And, um, and he didn't even tell him why at first. He just said, I want you to build this boat for me and, and gave him all the dimensions and everything. And Noah says yes to him. And then God tells him why, you know, because I'm going to wipe out everybody. And, um, and just his obedience and to, to leave farming, to become now a carpenter, you know, like God can take you out of what you are normally, what you think you're supposed to be doing and, and he can put you in a whole new path, you know? And, and so he put Noah in this whole new path to, to become a carpenter. And it wasn't just, you know, build this for two years, 120 years he built that ark. And, and so to gather all the wood, to pound the nails in, to measure things out, to do all this. And there's never any record of him complaining about it or him saying after year 99, you know, this yeah. is enough. I can't do this anymore, you know? And people making fun of him and doing all this stuff. So he would have had, and it was a wicked world or else God wouldn't have him build this art. And, and he never quit. He just kept, you know, the day-to-day -day drudgery of building, you know, this wood, all the splinters and all the, you know, mm -hmm. aches and pains of building this thing. And, and he puts it together and then God just takes care of it, you know, and, and you see God brings all the animals and he puts them on the ark and, and, and then the Lord closes the door so he doesn't have to, you know, and then they go and, and can you imagine, I get so seasick and I, get I do too. Yeah. I have to wear like a patch, you know, I like why? yeah, I get so sick. And so thinking of being on that boat with all the storms and everything. And then when they finally hit ground and they're sitting there on top of the mountain and, you know, he sits there for a while and they stink, you know, can you imagine this? I cannot. No. Oh. And, um, and that's another thing I don't like, but anyhow, and, and then to open up the window and he could have looked outside and waited, you know, he sends a dove out, wait, wait. 
And, and he could have thought, well, I guess we could just go out, but, but he waited for God's word. Like he waited until yeah. God said it was okay to go out. And that really impacted me too, that, that he didn't move ahead of God. He didn't get antsy, you know, and think what well, looks okay. Everything, the circumstances look like I can go out, but he could have fallen straight into a sinkhole, you know, cause yeah. the ground would be so wet. Yeah. And, um, but he waited and then God told him and just to wait on God's word, Mm -hmm. um, and, and have those big decisions in your life that you wait to hear from God. And, and so Noah was really remarkable. And I think we just picture him as a nursery school kind of story, but when you get down to studying him, he was such a man of God and yeah. such a full of faith and hard worker and, and just went at it, you know, mm -hmm. and I just so appreciate his story. So well, your recounting of him is so anointed, but honestly, it makes me, uh, makes me think that Mrs. Noah may be a hero of mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I, know. I know. And then how much, you know, quarantine that we've endured, uh, yeah. for the minimal time we have, uh, there may be a Bible study coming out of this yeah. one for you, Rachel Ruth. I mean, really I so many similarities right yeah. here. But again, I mean, that just gives our audience just a little taste of some of the, the ways that I've been blessed through your study, which makes God's word, his word is alive and it, it is active, but you also have been blessed with the gift of teaching to communicate that truth in such realistic and applicable ways to what's happening right now, because everything from Genesis Revel to Revelation, it is it is real for us today, um, whatever that we're dealing with. Speaking of Noah and Mrs. Noah, your mom and dad were married how many years? They, oh no, let's see, 49. Yeah. So, um, and I, oh goodness, I think that's right, 49, because it was right before their anniversary that he yep. passed away. Yep. And um, so, but, um, yep. but amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and I, I, I want to segue into to marriage because, uh, you know, ministries in marriage, I think so often, you know, when you are in ministry, you're not just uh, a target for the enemy or the bullseye. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was blessed to see your mom and dad behind the scenes and see them love each other. And your dad was so supportive and so selfless in his support of your mom, because your mom really did have a very, and does have a very public ministry. And she was gone a lot, as was my dad. And so, you know, I watched those helpmates truly being the godly helpmate that they were called to be, just like your grandmother was, you know, to, to Daddy Bill. What, what do you admire most or what did you admire most about your mom and dad's commitment to love? I think maybe just that, that they were committed. Yeah. And, and it was sweet how my dad was selfless and letting my mom travel so much and be gone and do her ministry and everything. But um, and he was so supportive, but I saw, cause they were two opposite. So my Very dad, nice. as you know, from New York city, yeah. rough, gruff kind of guy. And then my mom is this regal, noble woman from, you know, the mountains of North Carolina and, and, and to put them together is just like, whoa. And, um, and so it wasn't, I know it wasn't the easiest of marriages and, and, uh, and not always smooth and great and perfect and lovey-dovey, but, but they, they were committed to each other. They loved each other. They were faithful to each other. And, and I got to watch my mom. The, the last six years of my dad's life were rough, but the last three were really bad. And she was in 24-hour care taking care of him. And and, and that wasn't easy because dad wished, I mean, he wanted to get out. He never complained. And my dad suffered so much and he never complained, but, um, but it wasn't easy for him. And, um, and so, you know, sometimes he may take it out on my mom or whatever, you know how it is for a caregiver. It's just difficult. And, and seeing my mom take care of him and cook him his meals and take him to his doctor's appointments and organize his medicine and have to get on them, you know, don't eat the hat and don't, you know, yeah. and, um, cause my dad was in kidney failure. So he, or he, his kidneys did fail. So he was in dialysis and for six years and, um, and just all that went into that and to see their commitment and their love for each other was just remarkable. And the last day of my dad's life, I happened to be at the house and that morning and talked to him. I was helping my mom clean up the house and, 
dad came down and, and he was like, Rach, he always called me Rach. And, yeah. you know, how's it going? And I made him breakfast and put it down. He was just so sweet. My, my mom came out and, and he looked at my mom and told her that she looked so beautiful. And, yeah. and then she went off and, and then, you know, the rest of the story, I mean, it was a yeah. terror. It was terrible because she yeah. found him unresponsive in the pool. And, and, um, but it was just a love relationship to the very end. And, and it wasn't a perfect marriage, but they were committed to each other because of, you know, Christ and his example to the church. And they stayed committed even when things were difficult. And that has been huge to me because my marriage has not been easy. And, and it has been um, a rocky road. And there have been times where it was so dark and so difficult. I didn't think we could go on. In fact, I can't even believe we went on. And <laughs> And yet God has pulled us through and we've been committed to each other. And I think part of what has strengthened me is because I watched my parents yeah. and I watched my mom stay faithful to my dad and my dad to my mom. And, and I, and I knew if they could do it, I could. And, um, and so it really, really has been, um, huge in my life. And, uh, and, and God can't, he can help in marriage, you know, he can give you what you need. To make it every day so and I think that's where your grandmother was was such a faithful testimony and witness you know because daddy bill was gone all the time and she was left at home so often uh not by herself because she knew she was never alone but without you know just his just being there sleeping together at night and things but she wrote the foreword to mom's book commitment to love because they related so much on that and as I got to know your mom later in life I was so surprised because, you know, your mom and I are both very type A personalities. You know, you give us a checklist, we're going to get the checklist done. You know, we're going to get it done. And um, that I, I was hosting her with uh, the first lady of South Carolina. This was in the early 90s. And um, your grandmother had just had, I think she had broken her back or hurt her back or done something. And I was picking your mom up at the airport. And Rachel Ruth, I knew, I mean, I'm close to my parents and I know your mom really was close to her parents as well. And she was your grandmother's caregiver. And I'll never forget picking her up and, and being a little apprehensive because I knew the personal story going on behind the scenes, but yet she's so in love with the Lord Jesus and his calling on her life. And he's enabled her to balance both in such, I mean, it is, it's not in her strength. It's only in his but to see that side of her, you know, that I think a lot of people miss because she's such an accomplished teacher and speaker and communicator. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the fact that she has such a heart of a, a caregiver, mm -hmm. um, again, you know, just is such a testament to, to me. And I know, it's, I mean, and again, I, we've got to, we've got to expound upon Mrs. Noah, because as you were talking about that, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking about that hidden hero behind the scenes. <laughs> Speaking of heroes of the faith, because you, you know, you have, so many of mine in your family that um, are, are heroes and sheroes of, of the faith. But let's go back to God's word. Um, a hero of the faith or a shero of the faith from God's word for you would, would be who? That is a tough question because <laughs> there are so many to narrow it down to one. I think maybe my top three, and then I'll do my one, but is Joshua, Elijah, or Elisha. And I love all those three. They were faithful to the Lord from beginning to end. And that's huge to me. Um, but Elisha, I love, like, I cannot wait to meet these men in heaven and women that, I mean, you know, you're going on, but, but Elisha was really special to me because he watched Elijah, walked along with him in ministry and knew the Lord was getting ready to take him up, would not leave his side. I mean, and Elijah, Elijah kept saying, just stay here. I said, no, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with you. Yeah. And, um, and follows him until the very last, you know, minute when Elijah turns to him and says, okay, what is it you want, Elisha? And Elisha looks at him and says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Mm -hmm. And, and Elijah says, all right, well, you're going to have to look at, you know, don't miss this. You're going to have to see me go up. If you see me go up, then you're going to get that double portion. So basically don't get distracted, Elisha. You keep your focus and his focus to be on the Lord would be to be on Elijah because God's spirit was in Elijah at that time. And so he kept his focus on Elijah. Elijah goes up in a whirlwind and, and Elisha receives 
that double portion, but it wasn't like some dramatic whoosh, you know, like, ah, 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 you know, instead he just took it by faith and he could have sat there and bawled and been like, he's gone. And what am I going to do now? And instead he had just watched Elijah part the Jordan river by taking his cloak and smacking it on the river. Elisha takes Elijah's cloak that has just now, you know, he's left and, and he hits the river, you know, and it, and it parts and immediately, I mean, he had faith, he didn't doubt. He just walked across that river and, and he knew that the Lord was with him. And then his miracles, the things that he did were just amazing. I, I just can't even get over it. And, and he carried on that ministry, you know, that he had seen in Elijah. And, and that's my prayer. So watching my grandparents or watching my parents or whatever, I, I just want all that God would have to give me. I don't want to miss out on what he wants to give me and, and to be faithful to the Lord from beginning to end, you know, not wander away or get focused on myself or focused on whatever I, I just want to focus on the Lord and what he has for me and and be like an Elisha with their faith you know and yeah. their well I did when you said Elijah I immediately thought of you and your mom you know it's all it's almost that's and that was the first thing that came to mind that that I can see that you you would I mean in humility I know but it's still when you when you recognize that there's a calling on your life you 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 do you have a choice to either you know, live in fear and in, in your flesh or go in his spirit, like you are so boldly going. So I, I appreciate that in, in that analogy too. Uh, going to, as we are concluding now, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you find and you're in ministry and, and you see the skeletons in closets and, and you know, I mean, you and I have both been in, in ministry for so long that nothing surprises us when you hear of, of a leader compromising and falling. Uh, one of a, a book that was impactful in my life, and I went to um, the Billy Graham Training Center at the Cove. Uh, Lee and I have gone countless times. We're getting ready to go back in May to hear Dr. Richard Blackaby. But we were actually we were engaged, and Mom and Dad sent us twice during our engagement. Now, of course, we had different rooms and different buildings. Yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget it was football season. You can relate because your husband's a football coach. And, uh, and Lee called me from his room and he said, uh, do you have a TV in your room? And I was like, uh, no, I, I don't. And he was like, how many days are we going to be out here? I wasn't, it didn't even dawn on me about playoffs at the time or anything like that. But it was such an amazing, once, once the shock wore off, um, amazing weekend of study with uh, Dr. Steve Farrar's book, Finishing Strong. In his first chapter, he highlights three men, and your granddaddy's one of them, and two others that were at that particular time in history, those two were better orators than your grandfather was, if you could possibly imagine. And within 20 years, uh, the researcher had done a study of these three men. Your granddaddy was the only one still walking with the Lord after those two decades. Mm -hmm. And so the whole book of Finishing Strong is a study in why was it that Dr. Billy Graham was the only one that remained faithful. And so he goes through in the spiritual disciplines that your granddaddy put into practice that the other men did not, you know, like your granddaddy would never counsel a, a woman. Um, these two men started to, and then they had a lot of infidelity and things. So that finishing strong concept was a tremendous way for Lee and me to start our marriage, even before our marriage began, because we kind of started with the finish line and focus first. And mom and dad really wanted us to do that. So looking at the state of the Christian church today, Rachel Ruth, what do you find most disheartening, but yet most encouraging too? I think um, for me personally, I think I've been sad that the church they're not excited about the Lord. They're, it's just like a, they've lost, it's just another thing, you know? It's just, it, there, there's, you don't see that strong faith, that love for the Lord where they want to discuss it with their family. They, they want to tell that they want to go out for lunch with their friends to talk about the Lord. You know, they can't wait to go to church to dive into the word. Instead, it's just, it's hard to find anybody that just wants to talk about the Lord, you know, to just, because they love him. And I've gone to visit churches and I sit there and I'm like, it drives me nuts. These pastors, 
I feel like they have a lot of head knowledge, but it's not in their heart. They're just speaking yeah. words and it's boring. You know, it's just coming across. There's no life in it. Yeah. And it so upsets me. It just makes me so sad because there's nothing about the Christian life that's boring. There's yeah. nothing about God's word that's not relevant and not Amen. that's boring. It's just, it's a lie that's wonderful and and I'm so passionate about it. And my family has been so passionate about it. And I think that makes me sad. And to see these, like you said, these people in ministry that are falling, dropping like flies, you know, just falling away from the Lord. I've got family members that have, you know, um, extended family members that have, and it just is so sad to me. And, um, and I think, you know, even dealing with people in Bible study that just hearing from them where, you know, if they doubt their faith or they think, you know, I don't think they realize all that is there for them in God's word. And, and so I think, and, and then you see the world kind of infiltrating the church, you know, where you, it just blends and, and then the church becomes watered down and, and they, you know, well, we want to be tolerant and what's wrong with homosexuality and we want to love them and what, or, or, you know, whatever it is, abortion or you name it. And I think those things just kill me because we have to stay true to God's word. And, and we live according to God's word because God's the creator. He's the one that came up with the whole plan and yep. who are we to question it. And, and we need to follow God's word and be excited about God's word, be excited about a relationship with him and, um, and not be afraid to tell people. And I think I just see a lot of watered down, yeah. you know, nothing kind of Christians. And I, and I want there to be a, a passion, a revival in the church, you know, so. Well, audience, I think you've seen today that Rachel Ruth Wright is definitely, um, she is being obedient to the God-given mantle that is being placed upon her life. I pray that you pray for her. Pray for her husband, Stephen, for those three girls, for their family, for their ministry, that she will continue to stay focused. And again, not seeing any gray in God's living black and white words that are very clear and that she is a teacher committed to the infallibility of scripture. Rachel Ruth, we are honored to have you with us. And I know our guests are going to be thrilled to look up your ministry and your resources and to get involved with, with your teaching. It will be definitely time well invested for them and their families. Thank you so much. This has been a joy for me today. Just appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.